My dear brothers and sisters, 31 years ago today, on April 14th, 1986, my older brother, Fernando, he died in an accident. And his death changed my life and my family forever. And I came closer to God because of my brother's death. Almost 2,000 years ago today, on Good Friday, our Lord Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, died and then changed all of our lives forever. And today you can come closer to God. In fact, you can be part of God's family because of it. Today I want to focus your attention on three things. First, on Jesus' interior disposition, on his attitude throughout his passion. Secondly, a brief description of the crucifixions in the ancient world. And finally, Jesus' last words on the cross, into your hands I commend my spirit from our responsorial song. First point, Jesus' attitude in his passion. Jesus' attitude is clearly manifest when he was interrogated by Annas and then slapped by one of the guards. John chapter 18 verse 19 says, The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. See, after Jesus was arrested, he was first brought to Annas' house. Annas had formerly been the high priest, but he was not the high priest that year. Nonetheless, he retained the title because the high priest was supposed to be a lifetime office. Yet due to the corrupt practices of the time, the high priest was bought and sold annually. So Annas was probably upset that only Jesus was arrested and all the other disciples had escaped. That's why he questioned Jesus about his disciples, but he also questioned him about his doctrine. He was trying to get Jesus to incriminate himself. Verse John 18, verse 20 to 21, Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather, and in secret I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. See, according to Jewish law, the testimony of two or three witnesses was required for putting a person to death. This means that according to Jewish law, an accused person cannot be forced to convict himself. This means that Jesus was not answering disrespectfully. Instead, Jesus was pointing out that normal legal procedure was that he, that he was entitled to. So Jesus, in effect, was saying, you don't have the right to ask me the, those questions. Ask the witnesses who heard me. Verse 22. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, is this the way you answer the high priest? He was basically saying, are you trying to teach the high priest how to conduct a trial? Verse 23, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Notice that Jesus responded by re reiterating his point. If I have spoken wrongly, then testify against me. If you are a witness, then testify, speak. This is what the law says. And then he asked the question, but if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? In other words, through his question, Jesus gets the guard and Annas to examine their own actions in light of the law of Moses. I think most people, including myself, would have responded in anger to being slapped in the face. What attitude what character quality was Jesus demonstrating here? I propose to you that he was demonstrating meekness. Meekness was the one quality that Jesus used to describe himself. Learn from me for I am meek and humble of heart. Meekness was the quality that Jesus manifested throughout his passion. What is meekness? Meekness is yielding my personal rights to God so that God can demonstrate His peace and His power through us. 
See, the opposite of meekness is anger. And Jesus is teaching us that we don't fight anger directed at us with more anger. That we don't fight violence directed at us with more violence. See, our instinct is when someone hits us that we hit back even harder. If someone hurts us, we hurt them. Jesus is teaching us how to not to con not, how not to be conquered by hate and anger and resentment. Instead, to conquer hate, to conquer anger, to conquer resentment with meekness. You see, Jesus didn't want to win an argument with a guard. He wanted to win the guard's soul through meekness. So Jesus responded by asking a question, why do you strike me? The next time someone hurts you, bring them to reflect on the motive of their actions by asking them a question. Why do you hurt me? Why did you betray me? Give them the opportunity to reflect on their actions. Now sometimes anger can be appropriate and an appropriate emotion, yet meekness is slow to anger. Meekness controls its reactions. Meekness listens more than talks. Meekness stops arguments by yielding rights. Yet being meek does not mean me being weak. And being meek does not mean me being meager. On the contrary, meekness demonstrates great strength of character and great generosity and freedom. Like a horse that, that permits itself to be controlled by a bridle. That horse is beautiful and strong, yet it is meek because it submits its will without submitting its spirit. I recognize that meekness is one of the virtues that I personally most need. Because my tendency is to lash out. I am meek and you are meek when we can keep calm when someone strikes us like our Lord Jesus. We are meek when, when we think about the consequences of our reactions. We, we are meek when we are obedient, even if we don't agree. We are meek when we don't pay attention to those who scream pro a profanity at us, like Jesus. We are meek when we can respond to aggression with a question that brings them to examine their conscience. Why did you hit me? Why did you cheat on me? Why did you hurt me? We are not meek when we respond before someone finishes speaking. We are not meek when we scream at a discussion. We are not meek when we seek a fight or where we punch the wall in frustration. So the question is, how meek are you? How meek are you? Are you conformed to the character of Jesus? Now think about that as I now talk about the cross. Crucifixion was the most painful and excruciating death ever invented by humanity. It is the pinnacle of human suffering and a way to terrorize a population. The Romans used it as a way to terrorize their political enemies. The crucifixion of Jesus guaranteed a horrible, a slow, and painful death. Jesus' knees on the cross were probably flexed at about a 45 degree angle, and he was forced to bear his weight with the muscles of his thigh, which is not possible to maintain for more than a few minutes without severe cramps in the muscles of your thigh and your calves. So if you've had one of these cramps in the middle of the night, you can begin to see just a little bit of what it was for three hours. The weight of Jesus' body was borne on his feet with nails driven through them. And as the strength of his muscles of Jesus' lower limbs tired, the weight of his body had to be transferred to his wrist and his arms and his shoulders. And sooner or later, by being placed on the cross, Jesus' shoulders probably dislocated. And a few minutes later, Jesus' elbows and wrists became dislocated also. 
The result of these dislocations is that his arms were probably like nine inches longer than normal. And this is actually shown on the Shroud of Turin. Now that Jesus' rib cage was pulled upwards and outwards, and his chest would stick out. And in order to breathe out, our Lord had to push down on the nails of his feet to raise his body and allow his rib cage to move downward and inward so he, so he could exhale, exhale the air from his lungs. Yet to push down on the nails of his feet was extremely painful because the muscles of his legs were very fatigued and severely cramped by this time. So in order to breathe, Jesus had to be really very active on the cross, forced to constantly be moving up and down on the nail in excruciating pain. Because if he didn't do that, the alternative was for him to experience asphyxiation. And after a few hours, his movements became less and less frequent as Jesus became increasingly and increasingly exhausted. To endure this without cursing those who were doing this required not only the gift of long-suffering, but the virtue of meekness. Jesus was meek on the cross. Yielding his rights as God. Now picture all of this as I describe the last words of Jesus spoken on the cross. Because to even breathe his last words, he had to pick, his, pick himself up on the nail. The last words came from Luke chapter 23 verse 44. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Notice that the gospel says that Jesus cried out, not in a soft voice, but in a loud voice. Jesus did not die with a whisper, as one who was forced to admit defeat. Instead, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, like a victor who has won the last engagement with the enemy of all souls and brought a great task to a triumphant conclusion. Jesus was actually praying at that moment. Psalm 31 verse 6. Now this verse was a prayer that every Jewish mother taught her children to pray at night right before going to bed. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus remembered that prayer, seeing his mother right there. But Jesus added us one word, Father. Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. It's very beautiful. This means that even on the cross, Jesus died like a child falling asleep in his father's arms next to his mother. Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. A prayer he had prayed almost every, every day of his life at night. Jesus gave himself completely over to the Father. Up to this point, the Father had led Jesus to the cross, but now the Father was inviting Jesus to jump into the abyss of death knowing that he would be caught up in his father's arms as it, and as it were on the third day be raised from the dead. And it was precisely in this perfect childlike surrender to the father's, to the father's will in perfect meekness, in his passion, death and resurrection that Jesus freed us from the power of death itself and from the arrogance of sin. When we were children, most of us, I'm sure, had the experience of being invited by one of our parents to jump off the bed or to jump off a staircase or, or the edge of a pool into the arms of your dad or your mom. And maybe our natural instinct 
told us not to jump, yet our faith in our parents became, overcame the fear, and, and we jumped into the arms of our parents, trusting that they would catch us. If we are in a state of salvific grace, then dying is simply to trust in the catcher. Then dying is to trust that God will be there to catch us when we make the jump. God is the catcher. And when the day comes for you and I to experience death, like my brother did many years ago today, like Jesus did many years ago today, then call on the Lord's name. Call on our Father's name. And stretch out your arms and jump and then just trust simply trust that he will catch you father into your hands I commend my spirit the father accepted Jesus obedience on our behalf Jesus meekness on our behalf Isaiah foretold that we had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Jesus has taken all our sins upon himself as our representative before God. And if we are one with Christ, his death becomes our death, and his victory becomes our victory over death. In a few moments, we will come before the wood of the cross to venerate the means of our salvation. Do not approach as if it were simply a reminder of what Jesus do, done for you. Jesus chose to do his Father's will in all things out of meekness. When you approach the cross, approach with meekness. Kiss it, embrace it, and yield your rights. Only if you are willing to make the Father's will your own will. Only if you are willing to accept whatever happens as a consequence of doing the Father's will. So do so in total trust. When you approach the cross, do so in total trust. For the blood-soaked cross is also the tree of life on which Jesus conquered sin and death. And after we embrace the cross, we, the children of Adam and Eve, banished from the garden, will taste the Eucharist, the fruit of the holy tree of life, as a pledge for the eternal life that Jesus purchased for us on the cross. And together we say, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever and ever. Amen.